Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. I hope everyone had a uh, wonderful uh, Constitution Day. Did you all celebrate? You celebrate Constitution Day every day. So thank you very much. I had a good Constitution Day. I did. Of course I did. It was a lovely day. Um, uh, please sign in for the attendance. I suspect the traffic may not have been ideal today, but please sign in. Um, the bookstore has copies, yes? Uh, I encourage you to buy it there. Usually I would say go buy it on Amazon, uh, but Amazon's backward by month. They are completely sold out. We sold out everything. Uh, good problem to have, uh, but the bookstore downstairs actually has copies, so please buy your copy. When you buy your copy, on the first page is a little scratch off. You take a coin, you scratch it off. You then use that code to go online and you can access all the videos. Now you have the videos already, uh, but now you have them like, legit, not like the Google Play copy I gave you. Uh, so please do that. Okay. All right, a few things just to show you about the, about the book. Um, we built a website that corresponds to it. Um, Nothing on here that you actually need, but we have a lot of photographs which are in the videos. So for example, we have Chisholm v. Georgia today. We have some, if you click on that link, uh, we have some photos from the book. There's a little slideshow you can scroll through. Uh, you can see various places involved, the people involved, the justices, and the screenshots. Uh, you have quick reference, what was the vote in the case, uh, who was in the majority, who was in the dissent, uh, uh, and you can easily uh, uh, see what's going on there. Um, this is also helpful for your um, outline. Uh, we've discussed trying to sort your cases chronologically. And one of the things we do here is we sort all the cases chronologically. Now, not every case that we cover is in this book. It's like 90%. There are some cases in the big red book that are not in this book, but just about all of them are. So if you want to use this resource for your outline, I would encourage you to do so, because uh, it sorts them by court and by year, <coughs> and you can easily see when which cases were decided, um, and you can just scroll all the way down. Uh, you can also see the cases sorted by topic, which is more or less how our casebook functions. Uh, so you have the foundational cases on structure, and then you have the cases on enumerated powers, et cetera. Please be on time. Thank you. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, again, this is not a substitute for the reading. Uh, it's a supplement to the reading. Uh, but I think it will help you. And already, I have professors across the country are buying copies and ordering for their students. So I think it's not just you. Uh, but you are my guinea pig, so I'm grateful for that. Yes? Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's very useful for background information. Um, one of the most difficult aspects of constitutional law is recognizing these cases arose in very specific political contexts. Things were going on in the world that gave rise to these cases. Right? This is not like a tort dispute or a dispute over some breach of contract. These were clashes between the branches of government or between the states or between people in the states. And to know the background of those uh, clashes helps to inform you. And that's one of the things we tried to do with this video series. But thank you for that question, uh, comment. I appreciate it. We spent almost three years in this project. Yep. All right, so let's get going. And um, let's talk a look at a poll question for today. Let's see if I can do this right. Uh, start quiz, no, start poll. Open high click or cloud. OK. Uh, here we go. They really made this new app very counterintuitive. I'm sorry it takes so long. Okay, so here's your question. Article 3 of the Constitution allows a citizen to sue another state in federal court. Article 3 of the Constitution allows a citizen to sue another state in federal court. True or false? And please, uh, please enter an answer here. Okay. I think I just about 
was viewing here. Uh, where did I finish off last class? Does anyone remember? No one remembers. Sorry, Josh. If you don't remember, I started at the front, which is the penalty for those sitting up front. Um, Josh, first off, how do we know that a federal court has jurisdiction, right? What, what tells us that a federal court has jurisdiction? Where do we, how do we know? Well, let's take a, let's, let's look back. You had CIF Pro last semester, right? What are some of the ways in which the federal courts have jurisdiction? Just from CIFRO, how do you, what do you remember? It's involved federal question and diversity okay. jurisdiction. Okay. Diversity so, and, and then what, what, what authority are you basing that on? What are you looking to? You're right, but how do we know that federal courts have jurisdiction over federal question and diversity? What, 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 what authority are you looking at? Do you remember? I'll give you a hit the statute. Thirteen thirty one. That, that that's not familiar, right? You have a statute <coughs> Congress enacted which says if a party in state A sues a party in state B, the federal courts have jurisdiction. Right? It wouldn't understand that much. Okay, Hannah, let me ask you a follow up, please. What gives Congress the power to enact that statute? Right? How come Congress can give federal courts that sort of diversity jurisdiction? Well, it's, I'm asking you a question, the answer is always the same. What gives Congress the power to do anything? Where does Congress get its powers from? It's on your notes. I know, but I know it's probably obvious, but. Where does, just, look up here, right here, right here, it's on your notes, I promise. <laughs> Where does Congress get the power to do anything from? Where does Congress get its powers from? Constitution? Yes. Very good. And where in the Constitution does Congress get the power to set the jurisdiction of the federal courts? Um, is it the article Very good. That's right. Everything Congress does has to come from somewhere in the Constitution. right? There, Congress doesn't just have the sort of free-floating power to whatever they think is well and good. They think they do, but they don't have that power. right? They get all the power from the Constitution. And Article 3 discusses the jurisdiction of the federal courts. So for example, it says in all cases affecting ambassadors, public ministers, and consuls, and where states should be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. Now Ethan, can Congress <coughs> modify that original jurisdiction? Can they add to it or subtract to it? Well, how do you know that Congress can't alter the Supreme Court's original juris jurisdiction? Where do you get that from? But how do you know that? I think you're right, but how do you know that? Uh, I can't remember. That's a very important case that you should know the tip of your tongue about that, that concept. It's a very important case. First week of class. How many cases have we done about the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction? One, but I don't remember the name of it. Yeah. Matt? Marbury? What did Marbury hold? Yeah. In Marbury, Chief Justice Marshall wrote that the original jurisdiction is fixed that Congress cannot enact a statute to expand or contract the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. <coughs> okay? But, Tanner, what about the jurisdiction of the lower courts? Can Congress alter that jurisdiction? Yes. Okay, they can. <coughs> so, Tanner, it says, the judicial power shall extend to controversies between a state and citizens of another state. 
It also says, if you take out your trustee constitution, right, go to Article 3, Section 2, there's a lot of stuff in there. The judicial power extends to cases arising under this constitution. Now, that's not familiar, arising under. What, what kind of jurisdiction is that, Tammy? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, arising sounds like, like, like um, a federal question. I think he's right. So the Constitution says that the jurisdiction, I'm sorry, the judicial power shall extend to cases arising under this Constitution. Now, David, does the Constitution create the lower federal courts? No. Who created them? Who creates everything in our government? Congress. Congress, Congress creates the lower federal courts. I guess we we'll follow up. Does Congress have to give the lower federal courts federal question jurisdiction? Can they just say only diversity? That's it. Can they do that? No. Why? Because the Supreme Court has the powers. I didn't say the Supreme Court. Right. I said the lower courts, which Congress creates. So could Congress say, lower federal courts, you only get diversity, you do not get federal question? Could they do that? No. Why not? It says it shall extend. Do they have to give the courts the full breadth of federal jurisdiction? I think no one. No, and what worth it to tell you that for the first hundred years of a republic, the federal courts did not have federal question jurisdiction, they only had diversity. Is that because it wasn't, didn't exist yet? Congress actually gave it to the courts, then took it back, and they gave it back about a hundred years later. Would you be surprised about that? It's in the reading. Uh, we do discuss this when we talk about Hans. The short answer is Congress doesn't need to give the full scope of jurisdiction to the federal courts. It's under no obligation to do so. It doesn't have to. It does not have to. What does that mean then? Congress can control the jurisdiction of the federal courts. The lower federal courts. But not the Supreme Court. Everyone hear, hear what I'm saying, right? Congress can control the jurisdiction of the lower courts, but not the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, they're stuck. So that brings us to the very first case, right? <coughs> By the way, um, let's go back to our poll question, right? Article 3 of the Constitution allowed a citizen to sue another state in court. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Nick. Uh, Nick, what's the answer to our poll question here? Is this true or false? True. Okay, why do you say true? Uh, well, it's just written in the article itself. It says, scroll down and click here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'll do better. <laughs> Does, does that say that the state is a plaintiff, or does that say that the state is the defendant? <coughs> it says neither, but the clause right above it says the state shall be a party, so it implies that whether or not they're defending the plaintiff, it doesn't matter. Hmm. So you think the answer here is true? What do you think, Sarosh? I, I say it is true because um, in the Constitution it says the same state, um, All right, so now, yeah, let me ask you a question, please. When I ask you what does the text of the Constitution mean, is your answer limited to just the four corners of the document? Are you only looking at what the words in the page mean? Is that, is that, is that the entire, the entirety of your, of, your, of your study? Is that all we look at? No. Okay, what else might we look at to figure out the meaning of Article 3? How it's been applied in court. Okay. 
okay, well, we're back in the 1790s now, so there are no courts to apply it in, right? What, what else might you want to look at? You give me a good answer, but let's go back to the 1790s. Um, probably the incense sin of the people who wrote the... Okay, that's good. And how do we know what those who draft this provision intended? What might, what might we look at for evidence of that? <coughs> um, Good, but how do we know what they believe? Where do we get evidence of that from? You're giving all good stuff, but how do we figure this out? Antoine? Probably maybe like documentation. Okay. Um, okay. Like, for example, like Hamilton and Hamilton. Madison papers, or federal papers, for example, that would be a good example. Ah, so m maybe Hamilton wrote something in the Federalist that might inform this question. And then let's just say, for example, that Hamilton maybe wrote one thing and someone else wrote something else. Madison wrote X and Hamilton wrote Y, which happens. We, we've seen a lot. How do we then like figure out this question, Antoine? I mean, 1793, so the Articles of Confederation had already been through, and then we had already gone through that. The yeah. Constitution's, Constitution's a couple years, years old. Yeah, so um, I guess maybe looking at those past or not mistakes, but um, the way that they interpreted their, the change that... Uh, right. So, yeah, so Jessica, let me ask you a question, right? The question here is, can a state be sued, right? Um, before the 1776 revolution, were there, were there states? Did states exist before 1776? No. What do we have instead of a state? And who controlled the colonies? So what might be something we would look at to decide if you could sue a state? What sort of history might be relevant? Trade <coughs> Yeah. And, and, and could the king be sued? Could the crown be sued? No. Okay, so um, Kobe, let me ask you a question. Let's just say, for example, that Jessica's right. You can't sue the crown. You couldn't sue the king. We all agree on that much. But then we have a constitution. And instead of a king with a crown, now we have states with governors who are elected. Did, did anything change about whether the state, the government, could be sued between 1776 and, and the Constitution's ratification? Did something change about whether the state could be sued? How do you know? Yeah, but didn't we say that whatever powers the king had fell to the states? Isn't that what we studied? Whoa, 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 sovereign, what's this, what's this word you use? What does sovereign mean? You're using a good word. What does sovereign mean? What's sovereignty, man? What's that word? And do they have all the attributes of a, of a monarch, of a king? Does New York have, does a New York governor have the same attributes as he wear a crown? Does he have like a robe and have like a little scepter? No, no he doesn't. All right, so Deanna, let me ask this question then. How do we know what Article Three of the Constitution means? We're sitting here in the year 2019. You know, the Constitution is under glass. It's fading. It's an old document. How do we know what this provision means in Article Three? I just rolled a smidge, and I still, I still have an answer, right? How do we know what this text means? Well, did people even agree on this question in the 1790s? This case we have here, the very first case we have, Chisholm against Georgia, was the first major constitutional controversy. The first one. Marbury hadn't come along yet. This is, this is really the first biggie. Um, so I'm going to say true to this one. I, I, this, this, this is Josh's answer. I think the better answer is true. But I will not begrudge you if you put false. I think that's also a reasonable answer. I think the better answer is true based on the text. But uh, we'll see that even in the 1790s, people did not agree on this question. Okay. Um, now that doesn't mean, uh, you know, that that the the Constitution is meaningless. I think this is a question on which reasonable minds can disagree, uh, because the text uh, doesn't provide a lock solid answer in light of history. All right. So let's actually walk through the history, and let's walk through Chisholm. Uh, oh, Vanessa, you printed out your card. It's very nice. <coughs> I like that. Oh, this is for, what was this? Oh, this is for something else. I'm 
<laughs> that's excellent. That, I, I can read it. It's, it's, that's, it's very easy for me to read. I, I, I've actually considered asking the school to print out these name tags, but it's too complicated. You go nicknames, they'll be called this or that, so I just let you write with a mark, whatever you want. I found it's a lot less work than printing it for you because people go, oh, I want this name, I want that name. So anyway, Vanessa, I'll, I'll use the name you wrote in the paper. <laughs> Vanessa, you want to please give me the facts in uh, Chisholm uh, versus Georgia, uh, 1793. Good. Um, and Georgia did not pay the merchant as promised. Good. When he died, the merchant died, the executive of his estate held the merchant of Georgia mm -hmm. um, in federal court. Good. Okay, so let's just pause here for a second, right? How did he get into the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction, Vanessa? What was his basis for original jurisdiction? Let's go back to our, our, our text. Um, the Constitution. Good. More specific? Yeah. Well, that, that's the diversity provision, but how do you get to the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction? What, what text did he rely on there? Just scroll smidge up. It's OK. It, it is in front of you. You're not looking at the right, <laughs> you're not looking at the right front. <laughs> So, okay, so you're Chisholm, right? You say, look, I have a dispute with the state of South Carolina. Uh, they didn't pay up their contract. So this is, you know, a fairly routine breach of contract case that, you know, you would sue 100 times over. Now, uh, Katie, I'm sorry, Caitlin. Katie, sit there, right? I have to remember, Katie and Caitlin. Uh, uh, Caitlin, why do you think that Mr. Chisholm did not sue Georgia in a Georgia court? What do you think would have happened if you walked into a Georgia court and sued Georgia for breach of statute? <coughs> what do you think would have happened there? Oh, more than favoritism. You're right. There's definitely local favoritism. I think you're right. But more than favoritism, what would have happened to a suit? What would Georgia have done? What would the courts have done to it? Why? On what grounds? On what grounds would they have dismissed a suit? No, no, no. He could have filed to a trial court in, in, in Georgia. Oh, citizens of the state? The let me explain this point to you, right? Federal courts and state courts have overlapping jurisdiction, right? Let's say I get into a breach of contract with someone from Oklahoma, right? I can go to federal court and sue in diversity, or I can go to Oklahoma state court and sue for breach of contract there, right? You can sue in different forms. And in fact, one thing you have to do with lawyers decide, what form is best for my case? Sometimes you'll be in state courts better, sometimes in federal court. You figure that out. But Caitlin, what would have happened if Georgia was sued in its own courts? What would the, why would the courts have dismissed the case? There's a very, there's a very easy reason. No, 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 no. State courts don't need diversity. Ben? Uh, they'd probably say they were sovereign. And they yes, they would. Georgia considered itself a sovereign state. And they considered themselves like the crown. Ben, when could you see the king? When would you, when were you allowed to actually challenge the king in court? Never. Well, you could in one circumstance. When could you sue the state in England? You were allowed in a specific circumstance. What? File a grievance or something. And what what would the king have to do? He would have <coughs> to. He wouldn't be forced to do anything really. It's up to him. But could the king allow himself to be sued? Yes, that's a key point. The crown could consent to a suit, but it's not really consenting. It's basically giving to a grievance. You're saying, hey, look, I got a grievance against the king. And the king says, you know what? OK, I will give you relief. I will be generous and uh, a good ruler. And I will give tidings to my minions, right? I, I will help my, my people out. You say Jordan? Georgia. Oh, Georgia. I'm sorry. Okay. So let's say South Carolina says they 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 interpret that clause of the Constitution as okay, we can be sued because we are semi-sovereign. Whose interpretation is it? 
Well, let's talk about this case for a minute, right? So, so Nick, um, Chisholm sues George in the Supreme Court. Did Georgia send a lawyer to defend itself in court? No, they didn't send anybody. Why did they not even send a lawyer to defend themselves? Because they felt like they couldn't be sued. That's the answer to your question. Right, Georgia considered for itself that we are above this. This is beneath us, right? It, it's like, I don't know, like, like a, if like a toddler says, I'm going to sue you, right? You say, oh, get lost, kid, right? It, it's like this little insignificant person who has no control over us is trying to drag us to the Supreme Court. We're just not going to show up. So now we have two cases where the other side didn't show up. Marbury, remember Madison didn't show up to court? And Chisholm, our case here today, Georgia didn't show up to court. So the court is basically playing with half a deck, right? Where only half the sides represented, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. Right? They have these, these important cases, and there's no lawyers to the other side. That's actually kind of tough for the judges. I think more work for them, for sure. Uh, but I, th I, think, I think Nick's right. Georgia said, we are sovereign. Had you filed the suit in a state court, it would have been dismissed for lack of sovereignty. So instead of suing in a state court, where there's definitely favoritism, Chisholm went to federal court. And not just any federal court, my friends. He went to the top. He went right to the US Supreme Court. Okay, and he argued that this is a case in which a state is a party, and this is a case between a citizen of one state, South Carolina, and a state, Georgia. Now, the court never actually decides the breach of contract question. They never actually decide it. Right, Jonathan, why does the court never decide the actual merits of the case? Very good. Very good, very good. Um, because they decide on jurisdiction, they never decide the merits. Um, now, ultimately, I think Jonathan's right. The majority of the court holds. Um, the majority of the court holds that um, there's no jurisdiction. Okay, so I can actually try and use this website intelligently in class. It's a great resource. Still figuring out how to use it. Not quite sure, but I'll figure it out. Okay. Um, All right, so the majority of the court holds that, in fact, Georgia is wrong. Right? Georgia comes into court and argues, well, they actually don't come into court, but, but the position of Georgia is we're not, we are not able to be sued. We are like the crown. We are sovereign, right? We are like the monarch. Whatever authority existed in 1776, then came to us as states. And the Supreme Court rejects this by a vote of four to one. Wait, four votes to one? What kind of court is that? At the time, there were only five justices. It was a very small court. Um, the size of the courts fluctuated over, those e over the early years. Um, and what makes this case especially difficult is that there was not a majority opinion. Um, the court decided the case by a process known as seriatim. S e i a. Sorry, I always, I always spell this word wrong. S e r i a t i m. <coughs> okay. S e r i a t i m. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Um, this is this is a loaner computer. My other computer, the, the power randomly stopped working yesterday, and I had to get the swap. So this is not my full time one. Um, seriatim. Uh, seriatim was a practice of the English courts, and seriatim means um, one opinion is delivered at a time. So whoever the first judge to write an opinion is, that's the first one that's published. And whoever the second judge for an opinion is, that's the second opinion that's published. And whoever was the last one to get their opinion in, that's the last one published. They're not published in the order of who has the majority, right? So it's not that the first opinion is controlling. That's just that's that's what you would think, right? But that's not how it worked. If they were literally in sequence based on who submitted it to the to the reporter first, which sounds insane, right? Um, the downside of seriatim 
is it's very hard to figure out what the majority opinion is. Um, if you were a practicing lawyer in the 1700s, you would have to read through all the opinions of the court and figure out, okay, what's the narrow thread, right? What's the commonality that unites all these opinions? You think it's hard finding a holding in a single case? Try finding the holding in five, five different opinions, right? Um, so it's very difficult to actually read seriatim opinions. This case is not so bad because I think they're more or less on the same page. I think they're more or less on the same wavelength, wavelength at least the first four. Um, and we have four separate opinions in the majority, and then we have one in the dissent. Uh, Justice Iredell, whose opinion I think is, is listed first in your book, is actually the dissenter, which is backwards. It's, it's not what you would think. Because you might reason, like, oh, okay, the court ruled one way. What? What just happened? So Iredell is the first opinion, but he's really in dissent. And then you have Justices Blair, <coughs> Wilson, Cushing, and Chief Justice Jay. Chief Justice put the opinion, I think, last. Um, I will cut to the chase and say that four of them held that the states were not sovereign. And therefore, the states could be sued. Right? That's the, the holding. Like, that's the basic holding of the case. And Justice Iredell was the lone dissenter. And he held that, indeed, the states retained sovereignty. And they could not be sued without their consent. They could be sued in their state courts, but not, not in the federal courts. Okay. Is everyone with me? All right, so I want to do these in reverse order. I want to come back to this with Iredell last, because he was basically the dissenter, even though he's first. So let's start. Uh, let's start one at a time with, uh, let's start with Justice Blair, who is, uh, I got to admit, a fairly insignificant figure. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't say that in like a pejorative fashion, but a lot of these guys just didn't do too much that, that that's noteworthy. Um, Justice Wilson was a huge figure. He was one of the, uh, the framers. He was one of the uh, uh, prominent uh, uh, people at the Constitutional Convention. Chief Justice Jay was a uh, governor of New York. Uh, he was one of the Federalist authors. Um, Blair, I don't know much about the guy. Uh, it's just, he's, no. this, is th this is all we're going to do about Blair this semester. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, is that... Uh, your name tag? Oh, Dylan. Dylan, you want to walk through the Blair opinion? It's, it's fairly short. Um, he basically says that European law is irrelevant and can be influenced by how the Constitution is expressed. And also says that, or pretty much says that, you know, they didn't find the Revolutionary War to still abide by the principles. Yeah, I, I, li I think that's a good answer. Um, he has this one line which I love. He says, The Constitution of the United States is the only fountain from which I shall draw. The only authority to which I shall appeal. I, I love that line. So I think he did. I like, uh, but but it, it's. But I, I have no idea what the the, the the guy painting this must have really hated him. He looks like a mom. I mean, just I I don't I don't know what, like what's sort of, there are other pictures where he looks normal, but just this picture got, the guy just looks really weird. Just maybe the the, the the artist just had a grudge for him. I I, don't, I can't tell you. Um, but yeah, that's Justice Blair. He says, look, we fought a war, of independence. And that war of independence was designed to move us away from the monarch, from the crown. And we should not retain this sort of um, uh, you know, reminder of who controlled us. We have our now own freedom. OK? Yes, sir, Matt? Is this the same John Blair that was one of the uh, delegates to the convention um, for Virginia uh, along with James Madison? Uh, I think so, yeah. Not particularly noteworthy guy. Let me just just double check. I think you're right. He was there. Yeah, no, I know he he was there. <laughs> well, that raises a good question, right? Blair was there. I think Cushing was there too. Uh, J. It, let me just check the name. Uh, oh, the names aren't in your pocket one, are they? Um, they're, they're they're listed by state. Okay. Um. Where, are they listed in here? I don't think they are. They're, they start on page uh, 56. Well, George Washington's not the first one. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we got... Uh, Jay was not there. I think Cushing may have been there. It's a good question. But even if, they, I don't, even if they weren't at the convention in Philadelphia, 
they were at their state ratifying conventions, which I think Matt raises a good point, right? These are people who all live through this document, right? They live through the ratification process. And even then, they couldn't agree on what the answer was. Think of the Bank of the United States, right? You know, within two years of the ratification, you had Madison and Jefferson saying, no, you can't have a bank. Or yeah. they disagreed with uh, whatever the, was decided, and then they got to. Well, yes. Yeah, so th there were some issues that were left open, which they just didn't agree, and they sort of passed text that the text they ratified didn't actually answer the question. There were disputes. But I think it's a good point you raised. But again, James Wilson, the next guy, this is for Mitchell. Wilson was a, was, a, was, a, was a monster. He was one of the most influential members of the convention. He was, I think, our most underrated framer, James Wilson, by, by far. Uh, he, he's one of my, uh, one of my favorites. Um, how does, Mitchell, how does Justice Wilson understand the concept of sovereignty? I mean, it's a, it's a word which we use a lot, but don't really define. How does he, how does he understand sovereignty? Um, he says it doesn't appear in the, in the Constitution. No. Yeah. Yeah, he has this great expression which Randy loves. Randy's very big on sovereignty. But for Justice Wilson, um, sovereignty belongs to the people. Right? That the power of government does not come from the states, but from the people. Indeed, the Tenth Amendment says that the power is reserved to the states and to the people, that the people are the ultimate source, the ultimate basis for any sort of power. And if the people are are wrong, that the, the, the people have a grievance, <coughs> then the people have the power and the duty to go to the courts to seek a remedy against the state, which in this case breached the contract. Okay. Uh, Wilson writes that there's no sovereignty without subjects. Right? If you are the king, I am your loyal subject. Right? I bow to you. We do not bow to the president. We elect the president. Right? He is not our sovereign. We are not his subjects. So he says that the concept of sovereignty is entirely foreign to our system of government. And therefore, Justice Wilson holds that the state should be sued in federal court. All right. Questions on the Wilson opinion? Yes, is it Braden? Is that a question? No, okay, that's okay. You all stretch. Yes, sir. I think Wilson would be Oh boy, that's a that's a hard question. I I, I mean I'm partial to Wilson, uh, but I think his analysis is pretty sharp. I, I I like his opinion. I wouldn't call it a majority, but I think it's it's philosophically very significant about what what actually Chisholm held. I I especially when we get to Hans, I think Wilson's becomes very important, right? Because under under Justice Wilson's opinion, the entire notion of sovereignty is foreign to our Constitution. And if Wilson is right, the Eleventh Amendment didn't change that, that there's still no sovereignty, right? Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me address this question briefly. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Let's say Justice Wilson's right, which I think he is. Let's say Justice Wilson's right, and there's no sovereignty. When you get the Eleventh Amendment, the Eleventh Amendment doesn't suddenly create sovereignty. All it does is just limit the federal court's jurisdiction. Now, if Wilson's wrong, and there is sovereignty, the Eleventh Amendment doesn't really mean anything. But we'll get there in a minute. Uh, Amy, you want to give me Justice Cushing? It's a you know, fairly, fairly brief, uh, not a concurrence, but another separate majority opinion. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and this, I think Amy's right. I think this, this text is a textualist argument, right? I think this textualist argument is premised on uh, what they wrote. It doesn't say the plaintiff is a state or the state's a defendant. It just says between a state and citizen of another state. Therefore, Chisholm was proper to invoke the jurisdiction. Yes, sir. Thank you. Reading section two, I mean, it mentions controversies between two or more states. Does it not quite literally mean the state has to be a defendant? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could read that to suggest that um, the ordering matters. So you think the order matters? Do you think the order first versus second matters? Not necessarily, because right before it just says between two or more states. And then you mean not, not a state and another state? 
Yeah, it's also possible that they didn't quite think about this issue through. But that cuts both ways, right? Maybe they thought, it's so insane for anyone to sue a state, why do, we, why do we even need to address this? It was obviously a state sues a person. Whereas the other side is, well, there's no sovereignty, so of course you could. Right? It depends what the background principle is. If Justice Wilson is right, then it shouldn't matter, right? If Justice Wilson's wrong, then okay, this is the only way to say it, right? <coughs> state sue citizen. So a lot of it depends if Justice Wilson's right on what the background principle is. And this is something on which the Supreme Court still disagrees on 180 you know, years later. All right, Kyle, Kyle you want to give me the uh, Chief Justice uh, John Jay's opinion, please? Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, I want to, Kyle, let's talk about that last one. I think you highlighted a very good point. What would it mean to tell Mr. Chisholm that you can't go to court? Like, what does that say to him about his, about his, like, you know, about his case? You're not worth it. You're not worth it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, sir, you're, you're beneath me. All yeah. All of a sudden, I got the king's power, so you yeah. can go back to your farm. Yeah, it's, it's degrading, <laughs> isn't it? I think, I think Kyle's exactly right. I think it's degrading a little bit, isn't it? It's, 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 it's humiliating, right? You made a contract with me. You breached it. And now you're coming along saying, sorry, too bad. I am not going to give you any remedy. I'm above the law. I am above you. You're beneath me. Bow down. Yeah, it's like money and rent. Basically, yeah. yeah. I mean, I have no idea if they even had a good case, right? We don't even know. This was in the revolution. It's an old case. Who the hell knows if this is even a correct guy? We don't, it doesn't even matter. But the fact is you can't even go to court. Um, just as Jay writes, I think this is a very good point, that to say you can't go to court is to say that you are inferior, that you are below me, you're beneath me. And the entire notion of our country is that the people are the source of the sovereignty. This is Wilson's point as well. Um, uh, therefore, you should be able to go. He also makes a point of saying, you know, let's say you have a, uh, you know, a, a corporation with 40,000 members. You could sue that. But that corporation is bigger than the state of Delaware. They're always picking up poor little Delaware, right? Always, always Delaware. Uh, I, was on the, I was on the Amtrak the other day. You can basically corrupt Delaware in like 20 minutes. It's a small state. Um, uh, but yeah, but it's, it's degrading. Okay. Anything else, Kyle, you want to add? Uh, just the third part. Was, Please, go ahead. Was uh, it had to deal with the Constitution or just authorize such an act, uh, authorize such an act to make the state and then breach it? Yeah, that falls within the spirit of the Constitution. Spirit? Oh, uh, I gotta stop you. Spirit of the Constitution. What on earth is that, my friend? He, he, you've seen that. <laughs> I'll give extra credit. No, there's no extra credit, but I'll give a, a, a thumbs up. Where have you seen the phrase "spirit of the Constitution" before? You've done a case where that phrase is used. It's an important case. Yeah. Who's that? It. McCulloch. Who's that? It. Yeah. McCulloch. <laughs> Marshall says. I'm going to paraphrase. I, that's, I hear that. I heard the. Marshall, st there you go. Marshall says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, let the end be legitimate, right? So long as it's within the spirit of the Constitution, Congress can do it. Right? The, the idea is, what is the scope of the implied powers? If it's within the, within the spirit of the Constitution, Congress can do it. So we have this discussion of the spirit of the Constitution. Now what, what is it, like the ghost of James Madison? I mean, what, what is the spirit of the Constitution? I don't know. What the heck that is. My, my colleague Randy has an entire book on the spirit of the Constitution. I love him finish it first. We, I bother him enough. We, we, we had our book launch on Constitution Day at Georgetown. We, you know, we sold copies. It was very nice. But uh, <laughs> we greeted on each other a little bit after a while. We, we have to give a little space. That's good. It's a lot of work, these things. But thank God. We, we, we spent probably t two years doing nothing but this. It was, yeah. You look happy in that picture. It's, this is the I hate you, Josh. What, what are you doing to me picture? It's like, I'm smiling. OK. <laughs> A lot. I don't remember. They sold out. Um, uh, the, the, they, they didn't order enough. However many they ordered, they ran out. Um, it's a problem because the, the, the publisher of these books, they don't understand, uh, they, 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 they only understand 
marketing for semesters. Like, okay, we have a fall semester coming up and we'll have books for the fall semester. They're, they're not equipped to actually sell books to people who are not law students, uh, which is a problem. So we'll find that very, very rapidly. Uh, but yeah, it was actually in the top 1,000 books on Amazon. I have, I have like 8 million books, so that's we're very happy with that. Wow. Yeah, it's like the number one in legal education and the comma, like all these various categories. Um, so we, we did well, but uh, they're completely, absolutely out. No. But anyway, um, going back, the spirit of the Constitution, the spirit of the Constitution is not well defined. It's, it's not a term that's defined well. Um, but it's something that Jay is invoking. So I think that's a good point, Kyle. Any other questions on the majority opinion? I'll move to the sentence in a minute. All right, Braden, give me, let's go back up, scroll back to your notes to Justice Iredell, who is the first opinion in the book, but it's basically the dissent. What is Iredell's point here? Uh, I think his point was that after the revolution, the king power transferred to the state, and there's nothing in the Constitution that expressly took away the state government. Yeah. Um, Chief Justice, I'm sorry, not Chief Justice, Justice John Jay, again, was the governor of New York, a very influential figure. Um, he was an author of the Federalist Papers. Uh, you know, so this is a this is a smart guy. This is not like some you know, uh, uh, you know, schlub. And you have Iredell saying, no, no, he's wrong, right? So I mean, even at this early juncture, these really prominent people who can't even agree on a basic question of our American government. So Iredell says, these guys are all wrong. They're all wrong. John Jay, John Wilson, these guys are all wrong, right? Um, whatever power the king had in 1776. Um, transferred to the states. Whatever sovereignty that the king had became the sovereignty of the states. Therefore, because the king could not be sued without his consent, the states could not be sued without his consent. Kimberly, according to Justice Blair, what's the remedy if the state does something wrong to a citizen. What's the remedy? Blame. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm Iredell, I'm sorry, the majority. Which is just as Iredell. Oh, um, there well, there's a remedy, right? And generally, when, when the government does something wrong to you, what's your remedy? Any government, our government. Well, there's a political process that includes going through, but otherwise, it's pretty limited. Okay, political process, right? So what does that mean? If, if, if the city of Houston does something bad to you, what can you do as a resident of Houston? Throw the bums out, right? Mm -hmm. Now, does that help Chisholm? No. Why does that not help Chisholm? Why can't he throw the government of South of Georgia out? There's an obvious reason. Where was he from? He was from Georgia. No, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. He's from another state. Oh. So could he? Could he affect the political process in Georgia? No. Why not? He doesn't live there. Right, so the remedy generally when the government wrongs you is political process. You vote the bums out. But because Chisholm was not a citizen of Georgia, he had no power to vote there. So effectively what Justice Iredell, the dissent is saying is, if you do business with another state and they wrong you, Too bad. You can complain, you can write a nice letter saying, give me money, but that's it, you're done. And Iredell says that, that's the way it goes. Okay. Now, Michael, how does Justice Iredell know that the king's sovereignty was transferred to the people? I'm sorry, the king's sovereignty was transferred to the states. How does he know that? Well, what, what evidence might you look to, to to prove that? <coughs> well, that's true, but is there any sort of um, reference in the Constitution to uh, this transfer of sovereignty from the crown to the states? Is there any sort of reference in the Constitution to this? So the 
the Constitution even use the word sovereignty? No. It doesn't. So here's my question, right? How does Justice Iredell know that the king's sovereignty transfers to the people? There's not like a textual argument. And this is basically the divide, right? I mean, you can look at the Declaration of Independence. It's on page 22 in your Constitutions, right? The very, very last page of the Declaration. And Jefferson says, as free and independent states, they have the full power to leave you war, conclude peace, contract alliances, and do all their acts and things which independent states may have right to do, right? Does that mean that now the states are just a mini crown? They're a mini monarchy? Any questions in the Chisholm majority or dissent? No? <coughs> All right, Angela, help me out. What happens after Chisholm's decided? A lot of stuff happens, real quick. What happens after Chisholm's decided? Okay, so tell me about that. I'm sorry? Now, Angela, let me give you one more question and I'll move on. Why was there such a quick reaction to, the, to Chisholm? What did people think about Chisholm in America? Did they think that case was right or wrong? Um, yeah. Um, after Chisholm was decided, there was a immediate backlash, right? Most of the time, you know, the Supreme Court decides a case and no one cares, right? The uh, Supreme Court makes a decision, like, all right, okay, let's move on. But this was 1790s, and the Supreme Court was this new thing. And for whatever reason, the people got very angry about this. Here's the timeline. Chisholm was argued in February of 1793. Decided two weeks later. Imagine that. This case decided in two weeks. Imagine that. Less than a year later, in 1794, Congress proposed what would become the 11th Amendment. <coughs> It was ratified one year after that in 1795. So within two years of Chisholm being decided, you basically amend the Constitution, right? You amend the Constitution, which is amazing how quickly they moved. They thought the case was wrong, okay? Let's take a look at this, right? The 11th Amendment says the judicial power of the United States, by the way, these are all screenshots from your video, so you should have seen these already. I, I think I'm going to try and use screenshots. It's going to be a little bit easier than PowerPoint. Um, the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any student law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. Okay, so designate. Let's just look at this and compare it to Article 3, Section 2. Just looking at the text here. What does the 11th Amendment do? Just, just looking at the text for a minute. It, basically says that it basically takes away the citizens. Okay, very good. Okay, so under the original Constitution, right, the, the, the majority in Chisholm said a citizen of South Carolina can sue Georgia, right? Okay. Designate, help me out. After the 11th Amendment, could Chisholm sue Georgia? No. Everyone agrees on this, right? There's no controversy. There's a lot of controversy here, but this isn't one of them, right? Without any question, the 11th <coughs> Amendment removes jurisdiction from Article 3, right? Congress can't pass a statute to modify Article 3, but they can amend the Constitution, one second, to, to, to amend Article 3. And what Congress is, they said, look, it says here, the judicial power shall extend no more. It shall not extend. See that again? The power shall extend. It shall not extend. It's basically taking back what was there. It shall not extend to a suit commenced. That means filed by. A citizen of the United States against a state. So that's where the plaintiff is the citizen and the state is a defendant. You can no longer have a suit in federal court where the plaintiff is a citizen and the defendant is a state. Nick, your hand was up a minute ago. Yeah, I just want to go back to your whole question at the beginning. Yeah. You said the answer to that was yes. Is that because you're like only focused on the language of Article 3, 
expected to. That's how I look at it. Okay. And I, 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 I think Justice Wilson's right, but putting that aside, the, the text, I think, I think Cushing has a better textual argument also. But everyone sees what, what happened here, right? Okay. The Eleventh Amendment was ratified. It basically says no more diversity suits, right? You can't sue another state. Uh, now, Caroline, could a person have sued at this time a state for a federal question? Could a citizen of South Carolina have sued um, Georgia for, you know, violating a federal statute? Why not? You're right. Yeah. This doesn't just mean diversity. It means a citizen of one state cannot sue another state no matter what. Even if there's a breach of an arising under federal question, right? So this basically says, I am a citizen of Texas. I can never go to federal court and sue Oklahoma under any circumstance. I don't care what the claim is. I don't care who the damage is with $75,000 and a penny, right? Whatever it is, I can't get to court. Brandon, but here's the million dollar question, right? Here's a million dollar question. What happens if I'm not suing Oklahoma? What happens if Josh, a citizen of Texas, decides to sue Texas? Now, as a general matter, right, let's go back to our Article 3. Okay. Can I rely on the diversity clause to sue Texas? No. Because we're not diverse, right? If I sue Texas, there's no diversity. We're all Texas here. But what if I sue under the arising under clause? Right? What if I sue Texas for, say, breaching, uh, violating the, the contracts clause of the Constitution? Can I do that? OK. So this was a question I gave, I think, to Nolan and David earlier today. At the time, in the 1800s, there was no federal question jurisdiction. It didn't exist. Congress did not have it. There was no federal question jurisdiction for about 100 something years. The only way of getting to federal court <coughs> was through diversity. Again, the only way of getting to federal court was diversity. And we just said here that the court cut off diversity jurisdiction. They killed it. So there was no way to sue a state anywhere. You couldn't sue your own state because there's no diversity jurisdiction. You couldn't sue another state because the 11th Amendment. Let me say that one more time. During this period, you could not sue another state because of the 11th Amendment. And you couldn't sue your own state because there's no federal question jurisdiction. You, you ha how are you getting to federal court? There's no way to get there. So for a period of almost 100 years, right? For a period of almost 100 years, there was no way to sue a state. So it wasn't possible until the late 1800s. Congress enacted what we now call the Federal Question Jurisdiction Statute, which says if there's some issue arising under federal law, remember that phrase arising under? I'm sure you love that from CivPro. Yeah, bring back bad memories, right? That there's some case arising under federal law, you go to federal court. If you have a amount of controversy, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, Brad. Oh, sure. I think it was 1795, but let me just double check my notes. Um, ratified 1795. Oh, God, you're killing me. I think uh, I think it's in the 1780s. Uh, I'm sorry. I think it's in the 1880s. Uh, but uh, one second. Let me, I think I might have it here. Um, geez. Uh, let me let me look up for you later. I don't I don't, I don't remember the top. Uh, um, now it's I know it's in the 1780s. Uh, 1875. I I was I said I think I think it's in 1880s. No, I was in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, it, it was the um, 1875. I just I googled it. That, 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 that's more or less what I remember. So until the 1870s, basically. There was no way to sue a state. It would just never happen. But then Congress creates the federal question jurisdiction statute, which means if a party breaches some federal question, you go to federal court. 
And this is what gives rise to, to the next case. We have Hans against Louisiana. So Ray, you want to walk through the facts piece of Hans? Yes, sir. Uh, here we have Hans, who's a Louisiana state citizen. Okay. Sued Louisiana, uh, for interest on bonds. Good. Very good. Okay. Um, so we have a situation here, right? Hans has a grievance with a state. You know, this is a fairly common problem, right? Hans has a grievance with a state. He claims that Louisiana breached a contract. And we know that a breach of contract is unconstitutional. The states cannot violate contracts. There's something called the contracts clause. Uh, now, Hans lives in Louisiana. He's a citizen of that state. If he went to state court, they would laugh him out and dismiss his case in five seconds. So that wouldn't work. So instead, he sued in a federal court. Right? He sued in a federal court. Um, now, let's go back to Sergio. Sergio, let's, let's look at our graphic again, right? Where is it? Does, Sergio, does the 11th Amendment, the text, say anything at all about a citizen of Louisiana suing the state of Louisiana? No, it does not. It does not. Okay. So then why, why does he lose? Why does Hans lose this case? What, what does the word anomalous mean? I think you're right. Just like abnormal or right. So could Chisholm sue Georgia? Could a citizen of South Carolina sue Georgia? If, if, Hans, was correct. if Hans was right, could a citizen of South Carolina sue Georgia? Yes. What about the 11th Amendment? I'm saying, could a citizen of one state sue another state? No. Okay. Could a citizen sue his own state? If Hans is right. You're getting confused. Let's try it one more time. You're confused. Other people are confused. Does the 11th Amendment allow a citizen of Texas to sue Oklahoma? If under Hans's position, could a person of Texas citizenship sue his own state? OK. So you see the anomaly, the weird thing, right? In other words, I'm a Texan. I can't sue Oklahoma, but I can sue my own state. How can that make sense? How can that be? I can sue a foreign state. I'm sorry, I can't sue a foreign state, but I can sue my own state. Again, politically, I can affect the political process in Texas a lot better than I can affect the process in Oklahoma. Right? I can actually vote. I can do things here. So the court says, we don't want to have this anomalous result that doesn't really make sense. Right? It's weird. We don't, we don't want to live in a world where um, people can start suing their own states. And keep in mind, we had just had a 100-year period where there were, no, there were no lawsuits against the state, right? There were no lawsuits against the state. So uh, I think, Matt, you're next. So then what does Bradley hold? How, how does he reconcile the text, which I think seems pretty, pretty clear, with the, the holding of this case? How do they square the text with it? Yeah. Do they think? Do they think, Matt, that Justice Wilson was right or that Justice Wilson was wrong? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And who who do they think was right? They think Iredell was right. I think, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure if it's Iredell or Iredell. I would say Iredell, but, but you might you might be right. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, I 
I, I there's a there's a framer. His name is Gouverneur Mars, but it's it's spelled like basically governor. And I had a radio host ask me, is it governor or governor? So I think it's governor. Uh, that's how that's how his family pronounces it. All right, but I think I think Matt's right. They believe Justice Wilson was wrong, and that Justice Ira was wrong. If the states were sovereign, then why do they do this? Right. In other words. The language they chose here is very, very specific, right? Let's just let's just modify it for a minute, right? Let me just just if I can do this, right? The Eleventh Amendment says you can't have a suit prosecuted by citizens of another state. Let's just change this, right? Any. If I wrote that Eleventh Amendment, is there any doubt how this case turns out? If I, if I made that change to the 11th Amendment, could you sue your own state? OK. Everyone agrees with me, right? If the 11th Amendment says citizens of any state, <coughs> done, easy, piece of cake, that is what Justice Iredell said. Iredell said you cannot have any suits by citizens. But that's not what they wrote. They wrote this. Josh. How do we make sense of this? The fact that they use the word any, I'm sorry, these word another instead of any. How do we make sense of this, Josh? Hannah, how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of the fact they chose this specific language? Why would the framers choose this language if they Well, Hannah, let me ask you a follow-up. At the time, what was the only way to get into federal court? Was there federal question jurisdiction? No. OK. So if the only way to get into federal court was diversity, what did this text do? The only way of getting to court is diversity of jurisdiction. What did this text do? What did this text do to diversity of jurisdiction, Hannah? Ethan? Uh, you couldn't do, you could sue in federal court on diversity. This killed diversity jurisdiction, right? The 11th Amendment killed diversity jurisdiction. At the time, the only way of getting to federal court was diversity jurisdiction. So I think, I, I'm, I don't agree with this position, but I'm giving you the alternate argument, right? If you look at the 11th Amendment in light of the laws at the time, there was one way to federal court, diversity. This killed diversity, therefore there was no way to federal court. So what they were effectively doing was cutting off the only avenue by which you could ever sue a state. That's what they did with this text. Now, 100, you know, 1875, so you know, 80-something years later, the Congress says, let's get federal question jurisdiction. Now, the reason why I don't find this argument persuasive is Congress had other avenues. They could have expanded arising under jurisdiction. And that happened. Uh, so I don't think they cut off all possible paths, but they did cut off one path. But that's the argument that's most, that's most commonly used, that the 11th Amendment cut off the only path to federal court, which was diversity jurisdiction. And therefore, that was the only way to sue a state until you get to 85, I'm sorry, 75, when you have the um, uh, uh, a federal question jurisdiction statute put into effect. But I wouldn't get that argument. I, you don't have to agree with it. I, I go back and forth. I, there are some questions which I don't agree with myself on. I, I go back and forth on. I, I, I really, I, 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 can, I conflict myself all the time. Okay. So the majority thinks that basically Harlan, I'm sorry, the majority thinks that um, Chisholm was, was wrong, that Justice Harlan was wrong, and that Justice Arida was correct. Matt, what, what does Justice Harlan say, Justice John Marshall Harlan?
schism was based like on a sound interpretation of the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, prior to the Eleventh Amendment being ratified, um, and that uh, I guess unless the state itself consents to being sued, yeah, then they cannot be. Yeah, very good. Justice Harlan, uh, I think, makes an important point. He says, "Look, I think Chisholm was right when it was decided." So in other words, he's basically saying, yeah, Wilson was probably right. But the 11th Amendment did something different. I think what Harlan's getting at is the 11th Amendment adopted a different understanding of the Constitution. That Harlan was correct as a matter of original uh, meaning, but the 11th Amendment imported a different sense of sovereignty into our, into our republic, right? That the court chose one conception of sovereignty, and the people who ratified the 11th Amendment chose another conception of sovereignty. Right? That by adopting the 11th Amendment, the people said, no, no, Wilson, you're wrong. Iredell's right. They didn't say that through the text. The text does not say that. Please don't get me wrong. But Harlan's saying is, I understand the entire ratification process to embrace the meaning put forward by Justice Iredell and to reject the meaning put forward by Justice Wilson. Right? So therefore, the 11th Amendment didn't only modify diversity jurisdiction. It basically adopted a conception of sovereignty that Iredell argued and rejected the conception of sovereignty from Wilson. And if you understand the 11th Amendment in that sense, these cases will be a lot easier for you. Now, not everyone agrees that this is an area in which people have vigorous disagreement. OK, Sergio. Yeah, it, it definitely reversed Cushing because Cushing was based on the text, right? Cushing said, oh, it doesn't matter, plaintiff or defendant. Now it does. But more importantly, it's Wilson. It's who does sovereignty belong to, right? It's the people or the states. Harlan's saying, look, Wilson was probably right at the get-go. I think he was. But after the 11th Amendment, not so much. After the 11th Amendment, the sovereignty belongs to the states. And we'll study a lot of Harlan. He was a very distinguished judge. He wrote many prominent dissents in cases like Plessy versus Ferguson in the civil rights cases and in Lochner. He's a very, very smart judge. And I, I, I take his writings very, very carefully. I, I am very hesitant to doubt Justice Harlan on just about anything. I, I'm, I'm also, I also don't like doubting Justice Wilson either, which makes it tough for me because I like both of them very much. I like Wilson, I like Harlan. It's like, who's wrong? Who's right? I don't know. Uh, Matt? Oh, you're good. You did your homework. Yes, I have a nonprofit named after Justice John Marshall Harlan. When you get sued, you have to pay up. What state wants to pay money in court? It's a lot easier to say, oh, just go away. Now, the states do consent to being sued. Texas and all other states have what are called claims acts. Right? So let's just say, like, you know, a Texas state employee runs you over with a car. Right? Or let's say a Texas, you know, office is negligent and they have you know, a slippery floor and you fall. Or things like that. There are cases where the state court, whatever it happened to be, uh, and then the state says, you know what? Yeah, we screwed up. We'll give you some relief in court. Um, or they might say, you know what? Uh, uh, this is not the sort of thing we want in court, so too bad. So there are some intentional torts that you can't sue the state for. You actually have to sue the person who did it. Uh, generally, negligence, you can sue the state. There are complicated rules in this, which maybe another time we'll talk about. Now, what about suing state officials? Let's just say. Uh, Remember the Houston Police Department pulls you over, beats the crap out of you. Not that it would ever happen, right? You can sue the state official, but you're not suing the state. It's a weird um, <coughs> wrinkle in the law. Now, this is a perfect segue to the next case. Why can you sue a state police officer who beats the crap out of you? Did you study? in towards section 1983? That sound familiar? Some of you are nodding, some of you aren't. Section 1983 is a law enacted by Congress. It was originally called the Ku Klux Klan Act. Uh, the section 1983 basically says, I'm going to summarize, if a person, if a state official acting under the color of law uh, deprives you of your rights, you can go to federal court and sue for damages. 
right? But wait a minute, Josh, I thought states were sovereign. The next topic suggests that not always. That Congress has the power to waive, to suspend, to abrogate. That's a big word that lawyers like to use. To abrogate. Oh, I didn't mean all caps, but that's to abrogate sovereign immunity. What does that mean? States are sovereign, for sure. Hans is our law of the land. But there are some cases where Congress can eliminate a state's sovereignty. If a person deprives you of your federal rights. So if a police officer beats the crap out of me, that's depriving me of my Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable searches and seizures. Right? They can't seize your body. Right? If a government official denies me a parade permit in violation of my free speech rights, I can sue them under 1983. Right? Why? Let me show you the text. Uh, where's Bernie? Uh, I will get, I'll get better at this. I'm still, still figuring out how to use it well. Uh, Anyway, I'll use this. <laughs> For example, the 14th Amendment, Section 1, will say, right? What happens if a state does deprive a person of their liberty or deprive someone of equal protection of the laws? We have Section 5. Section 5 gives Congress a power the power to enforce by legislation, Section 1. So if a state is depriving a person of equal protection, or say it's denying someone certain liberty without due process of law, Congress can step in and they can act legislation. And what does that legislation do? It means you can sue the state. You can sue the state for your injury. You can go to federal court and seek damages against the state. So if a state police officer deprives you of your rights under the Fourth Amendment, they seize you, right? You go to federal court, Section 1983, sue them, you get damages. Now there's a huge discussion about whether you can actually collect damage, that's very hard. Uh, police officers have what's called qualified immunity. You ever hear the phrase qualified immunity? Which generally means, and I'm summarizing grossly, unless the cop violates clearly established law, they really screw up, you're not getting a penny. So you're not getting much, right? It, it, this, this, the entire doctrine of suing you know, government officials doesn't get you very far. But in theory, at least, you can get damages because they violated your constitutional rights. And that allows Congress to waive a state sovereign immunity. OK? Everyone with me? Um, our next case. Uh, uh, Bernie, a uh, city of Bernie versus Flores, uh, considers when Congress can abrogate state sovereign immunity. Okay. All right, who's next? Who's next? Matthew or Tanner? I can't remember. Tanner. All right, Tanner, you want to give me, please, the facts in uh, Bernie versus Flores? <coughs> okay, so it's a church. Yeah, imagine that, a church that needs more space. It's the opposite of what's going on now, right? Um, and so the archbishop, um, the archbishop he, uh, he applies for a grant, um, it, or it isn't a grant, but it's like a permit in order to expand on the church or to tear down and expand yeah. on the church. And um, it is denied by the city council. Um, so he brings a suit. Okay. So fun fact, um, uh, we have a new justice in the Texas Supreme Court, Justice Brett Busby, who is from Houston. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, he had his investiture last weekend in Austin, uh, which I went to. Um, this is such a good fact. His grandfather, Justice Busby's 96-year-old grandfather, Billy Busby, worked on the Planning Commission in Bernie, Texas. And he was the one who denied the building permit to the church. 
And I asked him about it. I said, why? I was like, why did you deny the permit? And know what he said? He said, it was a beautiful church. I didn't want to ruin it. <laughs> You're laughing. He said, it's a beautiful church. I didn't want to mess with it. And he said, you know what? They had another wall. They could have knocked on another wall, but I didn't want them to knock on the front. And apparently they never changed it either. After all this litigation, it's still there. But he was, he was like, yes, he was like, he was, I'm damn proud of it. He was, he was actually, the guy's, the guy's 96, but sharper than that. He was getting all, I was like, yeah, I denied their permit. <laughs> it was hilarious. I couldn't believe it. And I asked him, I was like, did you ever think this would go to the Supreme Court? He's like, no. And he's not a lawyer. He, you know, he didn't, he, he's, you know, they're planning commission. These are people who uh, figure out aesthetics. I, I teach property also. I, I hate zoning stuff to the, maybe another time I'll ask about it. I don't want to give him a hard time. But yeah, Billy Busby, the grandfather of Justice Brett Busby in your Supreme Court, denied the building permit to the church. There you go. OK. Uh, where am I up to? OK. So I think, yeah, thank you, Tanner. That, that, that's correct. So. Uh, Bernie, the city of Bernie, which is outside San Antonio somewhere, um, denies the permit to build. Now, you haven't taken property to yet. Uh, I'll give you a preview. Uh, generally, when the government denies your building permit, you're screwed, right? You can appeal it, they're gonna deny it again, right? You can file grievances, they're gonna deny it. Uh, courts do not review building permit denials in most cases. In most cases, they'd say, all right, whatever the, Committee said we'll, we'll defer. Now, David, did Mr. I'm sorry, did Archbishop Flores, did he decide to sue in state court and go through the process that the state courts allow? Uh, no. Okay, what did Mr. F what did Archbishop Flores do instead? He sued in federal court. He went to federal court. Okay, this is important, right? Again, Texas had a process by which you could challenge a denial of a permit. Wasn't going to get it. He's going to lose. Instead, David, he went to federal court. Why did he go to federal court? Uh, because of the, the RFRA. RIFRA, one of my favorite <laughs> acronyms. There, 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 there are many acronyms that I like, but this is one of my favorite ones, is, is, is RIFRA, which is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA. My absolute favorite, this one I love, is RILUPA. <laughs> RILUPA, <coughs> the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. The first good, but RIFRA is better, right? Okay, so David, tell me, what what was RIFRA? Uh, basically it said that it, get, it prohibited the government from, from substantial burdening uh, a person's freedom of religion, but it allowed them to if it was uh, neutral towards that, basically. Yeah. All right, so I need to give you a brief history about the free exercise of religion. Uh, brief, I promise. Uh, you are now obligated to take First Amendment, so you'll learn this more later. Uh, but the First Amendment says that Congress should make no law proving the free exercise of religion. Okay, what does it mean, the free exercise of religion? Uh, does that mean they can't make you, you know, worship another god? Does that mean that they can't burden your religion of how you pay taxes, you know, maybe make you pay a tax for a church? Uh, or does that mean that they can't do stuff that makes your practice more difficult? So I'll give you a couple examples. Sherbert against Gurner was a case in the 1960s. And you see I find typos that drive me nuts in this video. Look at this. Who notices what's wrong with the citation? See how good your blue book eyes are. What's wrong with these parentheticals? I know. <laughs> this crap makes me so mad. You have no idea. Uh, and in fact, I think some that, uh, yeah, the, you're not supposed to italicize the, the parenthetical. Try explaining to a video editor what it means to italicize a period. Right? Just try explaining it to your mom or your dad. Like, what do you mean by italicize a period? What does that even mean? Yes, they're, they're kind of, they're angled. So, yes, they're, they're, this, this is why this thing took us so long, because we're dealing with non-lawyers, and it's like, no, no, you have two spaces, you have to put, you know, in the, you know it's just, they don't understand, so, yeah, so, pretend those aren't italicized, and it's gonna burn time right now. Oh, God. <laughs> and there's actually, I found another typo. There's a quotation mark that should be open, but it's closed. At the end of a sentence, is an open quotation mark. They're curled the wrong way. Uh, I know, I know, I know. Did, I know, I know. I hope you'll you'll indulge me. Mainly. Uh, well, I can see it. 
<laughs> I am tuned to the way my friend. Okay, so there are a couple of cases. Sherbert versus Werner is the first case I want to mention, right? What were the facts in Sherbert? Um, you had a Seventh Day Adventist, right? This is a religion that celebrates their Sabbath on the Saturday instead of Sunday. Uh, Adele Sherbert uh, applied for unemployment benefits from the state. The state said, well, uh, we might have some work for you on Saturday. If you can take that, you should. But if you're not willing to take work on Saturday, we'll deny you benefits. Uh, she said, I can't take the job on Saturday. Give me any job on any other day of the week, but I cannot take a job on Saturday. And the court ruled in her favor. They said that this law, the South Carolina law, imposes a substantial burden on her religion. Right? It burdens her religion. That she's given a choice. She's either going to accept her benefits or work on her day of rest, her Sabbath. Uh, now, there might be cases where the state can burden a religion, but they need a compelling interest and a really good reason, right? Why was the state not giving Adele Sherbert accommodation? Well, they were afraid of people, you know, making stuff up, getting fraud. So, like, oh, yeah, my Sabbath is on Tuesdays, right? You know, making some stuff up. That's not a good enough reason, right? They can have a case-by-case -case basis of how to handle it. Uh, that was the case from the 60s, Adele for Sher uh, sorry, Sherbert versus Werner. The court more or less overruled Sherbert in 1990 in a case called Employment Division versus Smith, you know, some 30 years later. And the court said that Sherbert was basically wrong. What were the facts here? You had a Native American named Al Smith. He used peyote. You guys know what peyote is? It's this like hallucinogenic cactus. Um, it's a very common uh, 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 part of rituals in various Native American churches, right? They use this. Uh, I just seen a couple of years ago who actually did it. He said it, it's not pleasant. This is not something you use recreationally. This is it's a very uh, uh, how do you describe it? It's not good for your stomach. Basically, you're, you're puking after you take it. This is not something that's like recreational. It's it's, it's a very uh, uh, significant ritual for them. This is big, a big deal. So you got you got a guy named Al Smith um, who used peyote. Uh, he was fired from his job. Um, he applied for unemployment benefits. And he says, no, no, we can't give you benefits because you were using a controlled substance against state law. The court held that was fine, that you could deny the benefits. Why? The controlled substance law, the drug law, was neutral. It applied to everyone equally, right? It didn't target any one religion. No one could use drugs. So therefore, because you had a neutral law, the state can't substantially burden religion. Riffer was unpopular. I'm sorry, uh, Smith was unpopular. People didn't like it. And in 1993, or I'm sorry, what year was it? 93, 94? 93. In 1993, Congress enacted a law called RIFRA. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, uh, President Bill Clinton signed a piece of legislation that was basically agreed by Republicans and Democrats. It's unfathomable today. This was a much younger Chuck Schumer, uh, there's Orrin Hatch, uh, 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 there's Clinton. Um, they signed this bill called RIFRA. And RIFRA was called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now, what does it mean, restoration? Not exactly clear. But at a minimum, it tried to bring back the Sherbert test, right? Sherbert said one thing. Smith said, no, 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 that's not what the Constitution means. And Sherbert said, yes, it is. Just kidding, right? They tried to restore the Sherbert test and bring it back into our constitutional framework. Not exactly, but close enough. So again, we have a problem, right? Supreme Court says, no, 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 Sherbert's wrong. Congress says, no, no, you're wrong. We want Sherbert. And the Supreme Court says, hold my beer, right? Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, Nolan, what does the Supreme Court say in, oh boy, we got a uh, warning. Oh, God, all the phones are going to go off now. You have the you have the first alert. What was that a uh, storm warning? Flash flood. Yeah. Jeez. Okay. Well, let's let's try this, Nolan, again. Uh, Nolan, what does the court hold in Bernie? First off, about Rifra. Um, essentially, that it is too broad. That it has to be. <coughs> No, I wasn't coughing at your answer. Your answer was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Water went down the wrong tube. Okay. Thank you. All right. 
So the court makes a few holdings here. And again, I don't expect you to understand the details of the First Amendment, but just get the basics. They said that Congress cannot redefine the First Amendment. We get to do that, right? Congress can't dictate what the Constitution means. We get to do that. In other words, Congress can't enact <coughs> what's called substantive legislation. Substantive legislation. Nolan, I think this is what you're getting at. What does that mean, substantive legislation? Uh, I guess legislation that would like, redefine the meaning of the Constitution. Yes, very good. Right? When I say substantive, and we use that word a lot, it means the meaning of, right? Substantive legislation is Congress saying, no, 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 we know what the First Amendment means. We know what it means. It means Sherbert, Scotus, you're wrong. Scalia, you're wrong. Supreme Court says, no, 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 no. That's our job, not yours. No, I don't agree with this in, in many regards, but they say that's our job. Okay, that's our job. Okay, instead of enacting what's called substantive legislation, Congress can enact remedial legislation. Nick, what's the difference between substantive and remedial legislation? What does word remedial mean? What does remedial mean? Well, what does remedial mean, just in the abstract? If I, if I, if I tell you, you know, you know, Nick, you're not doing so well in this class, can you take some remedial actions? Backwards? Back. How about this? Nick, you're not doing so well. I may have to take some remedial actions against you. Punishment. What's the root of remedial? Remedy. There it is. Remedy. Right? Remedial. Remedy. Remedial means you're correcting a violation. Right? You're correcting some sort of wrong. <coughs> substantive means you're defining the substance of the Constitution. Remedial means you're remedying a violation of the Constitution. And we see the difference, right? With substantive, you're saying, here's what the Constitution means. And with remedy, you're saying, here's what happens if you violate it. The court says that the justices define the substance. They say here what the Constitution means. And then once the justices define the substance, Congress comes in and can make remedies for violating it. So for example, Section 1983. The court says, you can't seize a person. Congress says, OK, if you seize a person, pay damages. So Bernie was a significant case. It establishes the rule that Congress can only remedy violations that are identified by the Supreme Court. And when the Supreme Court identifies a violation of the law, Congress can enact monetary remedies. Yes, Amy? It gives meaning to the Constitution, right? It, def it, 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 it defines what the Constitution says. People say substantive or substantive. I hear both. I, I, don't, I don't have a preference. I say. Yeah, I, I, hear, I hear substantive a lot. I say substantive, but that, that's, I don't really care. Nick? If Congress didn't uh, pass an amendment for the whole idea behind the honor of honor, would that work? Could an that amendment work? to the Constitution? Yeah. At that point, sure. <coughs> sure. If, if Congress says that the Supreme Court screwed up the, the free exercise clause, they could have amended the First Amendment. Now, that's not going to happen. Unlikely. Right? That's why they passed simple legislation. But this was an important decision. The court said, hey, it's our job to define the Constitution, not you, Congress. Sit down. Right? And this was a law that was very popular, and the Supreme Court said, nope, sorry, it's unconstitutional. Right? So the upshot of RIFRA is the court says, we define the Constitution. Now, what's the test? I think this is the hardest part of, of Bernie. Um, The court puts forward this test that, again, is, is not very easy to apply. And it gives a lot of students difficulty. It's called the congruent and proportionality test. Oh my god. The, con the congruent and proportionality test. I'll, I'll make this as easy as I can, I promise. And 
this is what we call means end scrutiny. Right, the means end scrutiny. Uh, what are you trying to fix and how are you fixing it, right? What are you doing and what are you trying to achieve? And throughout the semester, I'll we'll often frame things in this fashion, right? What's the, what's the injury, right? What, what's actually wrong? And then how are you actually trying to fix that? And you have to assess the fit between the means and the ends, right? So what does that mean? The court, and I'll explain this, the court writes, there must be a congruence and proportionality between the injury to be prevented or remedied and the means adopted to that end. Lacking such a connection, legislation may become substantive in operation and effect. In other words, Congress can only remedy wrongs that can't create substantive legislation. Okay. So what do we have here in this case? What's the injury to be prevented? The injury is a burden on the free exercise of religion. Okay. How is Congress remedying that injury? The, the, the state needs to go to federal court and ensure they have a compelling interest to justify that burden. The court says that that is not good enough, right? That there's too much of a gap between what the court has set up burdening religion and the actual remedy. That the state has this additional burden that is not consistent with Supreme Court precedent, therefore it's substantive and not remedial legislation. Okay? In other words, it's not targeted. You have this huge problem, which is free exercise of religion, and you have this huge burden of making the state go to federal court to defend themselves. That is too much of a burden for the states. It's not proportional, right? To drag into court the plaintiffs. That's rather the states. And let me say this one more time in a different way. This is a zoning dispute, right? This is a fairly routine, boring zoning dispute. If the city denied a building permit to, I don't know, like a hot dog stand or something, this wouldn't be a matter of federal court. It's only because this involves religion. So what happens here is the court says that there's too much of a gap between what Congress is trying to do and the remedy. They need to have something a little bit more tightly focused. This will not make a lot of sense until we do the other cases today. <coughs> Uh, uh, we do a uh, Garrett and we and we do Hibbs. It makes a little bit more sense. We do those cases. Um, I'm sorry, not, I know it's on Garrett, but when we do we do Hibbs. Yeah, I know you freaked out for me. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, uh, this is what I'm saying. Some of the books in here I don't assign. Uh, some of the cases, though. It, it, it. Okay. But does everyone get Bernie? Right. You have to ask yourselves: Is Congress trying to? The thunder. Uh, stay here, guys. You're going to do home so quickly. Just hang around for a bit. Uh, do you have class after this? Two. Two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. My, my, my second class may have lighter attendance, I think. Um, uh, you have situations where Congress is trying to waive a state's sovereign immunity, and Bernie puts limits on when that could be done. So the upshot of this case is that RIFRA was not constitutional. That RIFRA still exists. Why? Congress can limit its own powers. If the federal government violates your rights of free exercise, you can sue the federal government for violating RIFRA. You can't sue the states. So you may remember a case called Hobby Lobby from a couple years ago about contraceptive mandate for Obamacare, right? The federal government can violate RIFRA, but not the states. The states cannot violate RIFRA, as a result, you can only sue the state for violating the First Amendment, not this higher standard. Um, let me say a little bit differently. Um, Smith is still good law for the state. If you want to sue a state, you have to allegedly violate Smith. If the federal government violates your rights, you can rely on RIFRA. Everyone understand that? Yeah, sorry. 
if a state violates your right to free exercise, the state violates your free exercise rights, Smith is the standard. If the federal government violates your rights of free exercise, RIFRA is your standard. So depending if you're suing the state or suing the feds, you have different standards to apply. Smith is very hard to win. You're not going to win Smith. RIFRA is a lot easier to win. Now, totally inside baseball, there's a very good chance the Supreme Court will rule Smith. Uh, very good chance. I don't think it makes another couple of years. I think it's gone. Uh, so we may be back in Sherbert versus Werner land very soon. Yeah? I was trying to get ahead of the history of um, one of my students in the first semester. Is Smith more of an intermediate scrutiny standard and RIFRA is more strict? Uh, I don't want to confuse your classmates, but uh, <coughs> RIFRA is basically strict scrutiny. Sherbert is strict scrutiny. Smith is the most rational basis. It's very deferential. It's hard to win under a Smith test. Unless you show some sort of hostility or animus. It's so strange you're taking first from it now. It's got to be confusing. You're sort of jumping around. Well, at least you didn't bother my italicized parentheticals. We spent hours and hours watching these, and your eyes like glaze over at a certain point. You can't see them anymore. OK. So questions on Bernie. All right. The second case, or the next case we have is Morrison, which is short. Uh, I think Sorosha next. We already did Morrison. This was a, this was the Violence Against Women Act case, right? Uh, and this was a case about whether uh, Congress can make it a federal uh, cause of action for engaging in gender motivated violence. We already studied this case for the Commerce Clause, and court held that uh, uh, violence against women is not economic activity. But Congress might also rely on its Section Five powers. So Sorosha, could Congress rely on its Section Five powers to prohibit gender motivated violence? Well, yeah, okay, good. So the court basically says Section 5, the Section 5 powers cannot be used. This is substantive legislation. It's not remedial, right? That VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, was not remedying some existing violation of the law. Congress is trying to create some newfangled thing, which they couldn't do. Okay? All right, Nayan, let me ask you, though, about the last case, uh, uh, Hibbs. Uh, what's going on there? You didn't get to the end? No, didn't. Antoine. Hibbs. Yes, sir. What's going on there? Uh, so it's about the FMLA, which is the Family uh, Medical Medical Leave Act. Yeah, you can't say FIMLA. That's not a thing. Yeah, it, it, you can say RIFRA or LUPA. You can't say FIMLA, although you can't spell FML. Go on. Anyway, go on. Go on but, FML. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a sweeping act. Unpaid, for, yeah, good. Uh, for um, health conditions in regards to the employee, their spouse, very good, very good, children, very good. Parents. Okay, now is there any question? So generally, let's say you work for a private company, right? And your private employer denies you benefits from your FMLA. What can you do? I mean, you can try to sue the employer. Sure, you can. Um, in regards to this case, no, no, okay, no, but 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 I want to just focus. So. Is there any problem with suing a private employer? You know, just you work for whatever company, XYZ, and they deny you FMLA benefits. Can you sue your private employer? Um, under FMLA, for yeah. FMLA benefits? Yeah. Um, you have to go to the federal court. Good. And can, but is there any prohibition on suing a private company? No. That's right. Right. Corporations don't have sovereign immunity. Now, uh, Jessica, who is the plaintiff in this case? I'm sorry, was it a, uh, a public employee or a private employee? Well, who, who did he work for? Who's, who's the defendant here? He worked for the Nevada Department of Human Resources. Okay, is that a public or a private employer? A public. A state agency, right? Yes. So what's the problem? Why, if this Nevada HR department, the worst HR department in the world, right? If the HR department denied this guy's benefits, um, he goes to federal court and sues them. As a general matter, why can't you sue the state? What, what, what principle would prohibit that lawsuit? Well, you have to be more specific.
specific. Um, What's the principle? Sovereign. Okay, sovereign immunity. Very good. Okay. Generally, generally, you can't sue the state. But Congress enacted FMLA. And through FMLA, Congress said, yes, you can sue the state. <coughs> yes, you can sue the state. So the question we have here, right, is was FMLA substantive legislation or is it remedial legislation? If it was substantive, creating a new federal right, then Congress can't sue. If it's remedial, I mean, Congress can create the suit. So, Kobe, how does the court understand the remedy in uh, Hibbs? Okay, why? Right, so we have this, this test, the means and the ends, right? What's the injury here, right? Sex discrimination. That in the workplace, Congress found there's a lot of evidence of sex discrimination, which is unconstitutional, right? States cannot engage in sex discrimination. And then why is there sex discrimination? Because often women are expected to maybe take time off, and when they take time off from work for sickness or childcare, whatever happens, uh, they're retaliated against, right? They're, they're, they're fired from their jobs, they're given demotions, they're, they're denied opportunities, right? That's an injury. It's more sex discrimination, okay? How did Congress go, go about remedying that for sex discrimination? By guaranteeing all employees, not just men, not just women, all employees, leave. Pa un not paid, unpaid leave. And by giving this sort of unpaid leave, you ensure that employees will not be retaliated against for exercising it. And if an employer does deny those benefits, you go to a federal court and you sue for it. In other words, the remedy they picked was very specific. It was targeting a specific attribute, a specific element of sex discrimination, which involved benefits of leave. This isn't like RIFRA where they said, we're gonna redefine the First Amendment and you can sue a zoning board, right? That was a huge statute. Hibbs was a heck of a lot more narrow. It said, look, we're not saying you have to you know, give them paid leave or give them a promotion or anything. Just let them work unpaid for 12 weeks. Just keep them on the payroll. right? Just don't fire them. And Justice Rehnquist, for the majority, holds that that's OK, that there's a congruence and portion proportionality, right? that there's enough evidence that this will actually address, will remedy sex discrimination. It's not substantive. It's remedial, right? So does everyone understand the difference between Bernie and Hibbs? In Bernie, the remedy was too broad. You could sue any government agency anywhere for imposing a burden on your religion. That's pretty broad, right? That's not proportional. In Hibbs, it was a much more narrow remedy that if your employer denies you a specific 12-week benefit, you can sue them. And the court said, that's OK. It's not too broad. And as a result, the court holds that the FMLA statute was both congruent and proportional, that the 12 weeks of leave with the lawsuit was proportional to sex discrimination. It, there was a fit between the means and the ends. So there was no fit in Bernie, but there was such a fit in Hibbs. Right? As long as you get the contrast between Bernie and Hibbs, you're in good shape. It's not obvious, but you have to just think it through a bit. OK, question on Hibbs. Uh, Justice Kennedy dissented. Uh, he was not happy with this opinion. Um, I think I have it over here. And Kennedy said this is not congruent proportional. Instead, it's, a, it's just a new entitlement program. They've created this new program, which they lack the power to do. Uh, Justice Kennedy would say, if you're a private employer, you can be sued, but public employers could not. Okay. Questions on Hibs?
Now, there's a note in the book, and I don't know how much weight to give this, uh, but Justice Rehnquist wrote the majority in all these cases. He wrote the majority in, uh, 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 he didn't read it, but Garrett and his other cases. Why did Rehnquist suddenly become a softie on this question? Uh, Justice Ginsburg made a comment a couple of years ago. She said that Rehnquist perhaps changed his opinion on this because of family medical leave. He had a daughter who was a single mom, recently divorced with kids. And maybe he had some uh, empathy uh, for women who needed uh, a, a, a leave. I don't know. I don't put much weight in those stories. And may maybe you do. People like it. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I think Rehnquist simply said that this was a much more narrowly tailored law in ways that Bernie was not. So I'll, I'll leave you to the side. OK. Questions on Hibbs, Bernie. All right. Uh, let me summarize a bit, and I'll let you guys out. Um, the entire concept of sovereign immunity doesn't have solid roots in history. Uh, but by this point, the court more or less agreed that the Iredell conception is correct. And the states generally have sovereignty, except where Congress can eliminate it or waive it. And Congress can eliminate that sovereignty through Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. But in order to eliminate that sovereignty under Section 5, Congress must make a remedy that's proportional to the injury, right? The remedy can't be so much bigger than the injury. They can't create new substantive legislation. It has to be just remedial remedy. Uh, the, the proportionality test is not very precise. And the court doesn't give us a lot of guidance on this. But you see it every now and then, and it, it does come up. There's actually one fun case at the Supreme Court this year. It's actually, it's actually kind of awesome. A, uh, a, 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 an explorer found a buried treasure ship from Blackbeard right off the shore of North Carolina. And he took photographs of this buried tre pirate ship, which is kind of awesome, right? And then the state of North Carolina was using his <coughs> photographs without his permission and didn't pay him. So he's suing the state of North Carolina for basically violating his, his rights to his photographs. And North Carolina said, bye bye, you can't sue us, sovereign immunity. So the court's going to ask <laughs> whether under the very intellectual property law, states can be sued for ripping off a guy's pirate photographs. Fun case, hell of a lot funner than this stuff, right? Uh, I like it because the outcome doesn't really matter. I, I couldn't care less who wins in this case, but uh, it's fun. R. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, I'm sorry, not tomorrow. On, on Tuesday, uh, we will start the executive power uh, with ex parte Merriman. Uh, that case considers whether the president can suspend the writ of habeas corpus during the Civil War. And we will talk about the Emancipation Proclamation which is the power of the present to free slaves in the rebel territories. And we will do Youngstown Cheat and Tube Company about the present's power to seize property uh, during wartime on the domestic front. And I got something cool coming up on Monday. I can't tell you yet, but I'll tell you about it on Tuesday. All right, anything else? All right, I'll see you later. Thank you.